starting to strengthen. And notice behind me there are further bands of rain. That's tied into an area of low pressure that's going to bring uh, more persistent rain across the country during Thursday evening and into Friday. And it will increase the winds as well. So that area of low pressure really will dominate from Thursday night onwards, bringing, as I say, a spell of wet and windy weather for most coming in and then kind of fizzling out. So it turns drier through Saturday. And at the moment, Sunday looks dry for much of the UK. Bye for now. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Good afternoon. It's time to debate the big issues of the day with me, Gloria De Piero, Liam Halligan, and a whole host of experts. Today we're asking, should we get tough on sugar? That's because a study has found fat snacks for children advertised as healthy options actually contain alarming amounts of sugar. But first, it's the GB News headlines with Rosie Wright. It's two o'clock, let's get you up to date. A survivor of child sexual exploitation is calling for the resignations of the Rotherham Council leader and the South Yorkshire Police and Crime Commissioner. Well, it comes after GB News revealed up to 1,600 risk assessments have been carried out on children considered vulnerable to grooming in the borough since 2017. Rotherham Council is now holding a meeting to discuss child sexual abuse in the town. A survivor who spoke to GB News is demanding action. It's a despicable behaviour when we're speaking about children being abused. And I think that has come from Councillor Chris Reid and Alan Billings. If they're incapable of protecting the people and the children of this town, they need to do the right thing and walk away. South Yorkshire Police and Crime Commissioner Alan Billings says he's invited that victim to meet police teams working on child sexual exploitation to help them better understand grooming. And the leader of Rotherham Council, Chris Reid, says he has the deepest respect for her and her views. Now, Lord Frost has told Parliament talks with the EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol are ongoing. The Brexit minister reassured the House of Lords he would not give up on the process until it is abundantly clear that nothing more can be done. The Tory front bencher says the EU needs to remain proportionate in its negotiations. My Lords, I, I gently suggest that our European friends should stay calm and keep things in proportion. They might remind themselves 
they might remind themselves that no government and no country has a greater interest in stability and security in Northern Ireland and in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement than this government. We're hardly likely to proceed in a way that puts all that at risk. Sir Geoffrey Cox, who's been accused of misusing his office for a second job, says he doesn't believe he's broken parliamentary rules. Labour's called for a standards investigation after an image appeared to show the Tory MP carrying out private work for the British Virgin Islands inquiry from his Westminster office. The deputy Labour leader, Angela Rayner, says that the actions seem to be a brazen breach of the rules. Border Force vessels are involved in multiple rescue operations in the English Channel. GB News has been told they're dealing with up to 10 separate incidents. That's after another 10 small boats were intercepted this morning. Yesterday, more than 500 people were found in UK waters. From Monday, people in Wales will need to show a Covid pass to go to the cinema, theatre and concert halls. Protesters have been demonstrating against the extended measures. Currently in Wales, you need proof of full vaccination or a negative Covid test result to get into nightclubs and large events. I've come to Cardiff today to make my voices heard, to actually have solidarity with people in Wales to say it's absolutely unacceptable that there should be any vaccine passports. The last vote at the Senate should not have gone through. It was a draw, 28-28. It went through on a technical hitch. Now we're faced with them being extended to different venues across Wales. Negotiators from nearly 200 countries are scrutinising a first draft of the COP26 agreement, hoping to strike a deal before the summit ends on Friday. The Prime Minister has returned to the conference in Glasgow, which is shifting its focus today to transport and low-carbon travel. The draft published this morning is urging nations to revisit and strengthen their emissions targets for 2030 so that global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Sir Elton John has been honoured by the Prince of Wales for his career in music and his campaigning work on AIDS. The musician received an Order of the Companions of Honour. It's recognising five decades spent in the spotlight, plus his action and work on HIV. Sir David Attenborough and Dame Judi Dench also received the award. Raring to go and I've got a lot more work to do as far as uh, my life goes. Um, so this is just a reminder, I, I think, that there's more to do. More work to do for music, more work to do for charity. Um, and life is great. I'm so lucky. You are right up to date here on GP News. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now back to Gloria and Liam. Coming up today on De Piero and Halligan. We're asking, should we get tough on sugar? That's because a major study has found snacks sold as healthy options for children actually contain what the report describes as an alarming amount of sugar content. It's not just our guests we want to hear from, of course. As ever, we want you to join the debate. Email us, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. Now, we all do it, don't we? Walk around <laughs> the supermarket, reach for a product which looks like the healthy option. Well, research published today suggests we might not always be choosing the product that's best for us, especially when it comes to feeding our children. Campaign group Action on Sugar has found that snacks advertised as healthy options for babies and toddlers can contain as much sugar as two chocolate biscuits. It analysed 73 sweet snacks targeted at children. The most sugary snacks claim to have health benefits such as packed with vitamins or made with real fruit. The worst offenders include... Heinz Farley's Mini Rusks Original, which contain the equivalent of two teaspoons of sugar per serving. Kiddelicious Banana Crispy Tiddlers contain more than 50% sugar. Overall, 27 of the products tested for this report would qualify for a red or high sugar on the front of pack traffic-like food labelling system. But that isn't required on baby food products. Action on Sugar want companies to be banned from claiming their sugary products have health benefits and have urged the government to cap how much sugar can be added to food. Both Heinz and Kiddelicious have issued statements. Heinz say sugar reduction is a key focus for Heinz for baby and we are looking into ways to improve the products we make. Alongside the original rusks, Farley's offer a range of reduced sugar rusks with 30% less sugar. 
Kiddylicious say the kiddylicious products highlighted in this report are sweetened by fruit, which naturally does contain sugar. We pack all of our snacks in portion controlled bags for tinier tummies. This helps parents to moderate consumption and also ensures that the nutritionals are of appropriate levels for children. Well, Dr. Kwatha Hassem, the campaign lead at Action on Sugar and research fellow at Queen Mary University London, joins us to talk about the study. Thank you so much for joining us. I find this report quite alarming, don't you? Definitely. Um, I'm, I'm a new parent myself um, and I had to go and look at all these products in detail. We're often distracted by the claims on the front of pack being organic, contains vitamins and minerals and so forth. And often that kind of distracts from interrogating the label further to look at that some of them have added sugar and some of them have uh, fruit juice concentrates uh, and others which are still need to be limited in a baby's diet. Would you acknowledge that the manufacturers are getting better on this agenda? They are doing their bit or starting to do their bit? So there are a few companies that we spoke to that have been trying to reduce the amount of sugar in their products. Definitely that's happening. But there are also companies that are calling for standards to create a level playing field for the whole sector. Uh, you'll often find that you'll have progressive companies doing the right thing but then they can be at a disadvantage compared to companies that don't, unless there is some sort of regulated uh, standards, then they just won't be involved in the process of reducing uh, sugar in these types of products. Dr. Hashim, I know Action on Sugar has been polling some parents of young children. What were the findings of those polls? So often we know that last, large percentages of parents are would choose a product if it is sweetened with fruit, and that kind of gives them an ind indication that they uh, that it's acceptable. But I think what we have to remind ourselves is actually sweetening a product with fruit juice or fruit juice concentrate is not that different to sweetening it with um, table sugar. Um, it's still free sugars and it's still the type of sugars that babies are supposed to be limiting. Now, I don't want anyone to confuse that with the fact that, uh, you know, um, whole fruits uh, or chopped fruits uh, and vegetables are appropriate for babies. It's when they're extracted, when they're juiced, when you've got a concentration of sugars to sweeten a specific product, that's when it becomes inappropriate. And let me just return to the idea or the suggestion that manufacturers are getting better. Because this should be about choice, shouldn't it? So if you take baked beans um, of any variety, you can get the ones with salt and sugar added or the ones without. We all know what we're doing, but there is a choice for us. You wouldn't want to restrict that choice. Of course, and I think what we've shown from this um, study is that there is a range of products. There are rusks and biscuits that tend to be in the higher end of sugar content. And then there are puffs and oat bars that might be in the lower sugar content. And so if, ideally, if parents want to be uh, uh, more mindful, they would choose those that are with the lower sugar. But often, actually, what we're, like I said earlier, we're distracted with the fact that a lot of these products have so many claims up to like, you know, six or seven claims on the front of pack that totally distracts us from actually uh, reflecting on the, on the sugar levels. And I think that research has shown that in itself means that um, some parents might be misled. And I think that's where the issue lies. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, it's not about just creating the options, but actually being transparent about what's in the product too. What do you want to see, Dr. Hasham? You're an academic at Queen Mary University of London. This is obviously a credible report you're putting forward. What do you want ministers now to do? We'd really like them. So we know that they've had consultation with companies that produce products in this sector um, and they have guidelines or minimum standards for amount of sugars that are appropriate in these types of products. We'd like these guidelines to be released, made official uh, and also to be mandated, made by law so that there is no entry for new products that come on the market that are even more inappropriate uh, compared to those that we've looked at. Um, just looking at when uh, the NHS Health uh, system in Scotland introduced the sugar levy, the, the Scottish government, obviously. Um, but the research showed that people in poorer areas consumed more sugar. And I can hazard a guess um, as to why that might be, because products which have sugar in them 
and we're not just talking about the obvious ones, but I'm thinking about pasta, bread, all those hidden sugars. They are filling and they are cheaper. So wouldn't you be better lobbying for cheaper, what we would call, I don't know, what posh people eat, fish, you know, all those things that are really expensive, salad. Is there, is there a better way to do this? Well, I think that we actually have a list of many different priorities from a policy perspective that we focus on. This is obviously what I spoke about today is a pro like it's more um, applicable to the story about baby foods specifically. But like you said, there is a lot to be done on making healthier food uh, more affordable for lower income households. Uh, and there's many different calls have been done done on this for example you know setting um the minimum amount of uh, the welfare system that could provide for people to actually be able to buy the, uh, food that is um healthy and not those you know products that we generally are on promotion and that are advertised and marketed tend to be those that are in higher sugar and we do respond to this whether you know it doesn't doesn't specifically depend on your income. Uh, everyone responds to, you know, a promotion or an advert. Um, uh, and so these measures will be coming in. We have some measures that are coming in that would stop uh, advertising of products that are particularly high in sugar. Um, and therefore, we might start to see a change in the environment and the types of products that we're uh, constantly kind of triggered to want to buy. Dr. Cowther Hashem of Action on Sugar of Queen Mary College, University of London. Thanks a lot for joining us on GB News. Joining us now is Christopher Snowden, the head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, good of you to join us. I'm guessing you're going to say this is all nanny state rubbish and we should be able to eat whatever we want. Well, we obviously, should, we should be able to eat uh, whatever we want, or I hope that's obvious, at least to most people. Uh, it's interesting to hear from her that um, they actually want to ban these products. She calls them mandatory guidelines, so it's obviously obviously a ban. Um, I, I don't find anything particularly shocking in, in this report. Action on Sugar for years now have just been going through the ingredient lists of various uh, products in supermarkets and then listing the amount of sugar, putting them into tablespoons or teaspoons rather, and then declaring the findings to be shocking. Uh, I don't think there's anything particularly shocking. I think the, the, the worst of the products had um, 32 calories of, of sugar in them. That's what two teaspoons is. It doesn't seem like people are going to get uh, obese overnight uh, at, at any age consuming 32 calories of sugar. So it's not clear to me what the, what the issue is other than uh, a lack of labelling, which I think is a fair point. Um, and labelling isn't mandatory. It's not as if baby food has an exemption. There just isn't any legislation on this. And it's, that's a hangover from us being in the EU. Food labelling is an EU competence. Uh, and it's one thing that I wouldn't be opposed to if the government wanted to bring in some mandatory traffic light labelling rules for food or mandatory ingredients. But we have to remember that Action on Sugar haven't done any chemical analysis here. All they've done is go in, uh, picked up the products. They probably haven't even done that. They've probably just gone to the Ocado website. And, uh, and had a look at how much sugar is listed on the label. Christopher, I'm sure quite a few of our viewers, their instincts will be similar to yours. They don't want bans or anything like that. But I, I think you've preempted what the point I wanted to make. It is about labelling. The phrase no added sugar can be quite a weaselly phrase on a product that's packed with sugar if you're a hurried parent of toddlers with a baby in arms trying to get a bit of shopping in your basket. And that mandate, that labelling, that clearer labelling, that will have to be mandatory, won't it? Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you, are you saying that there should be a ban on saying no added sugar or saying that this product contains a vitamin? I'm saying it should be mandatory that the labelling is clearer. I think you and I agree on that. I think it is actually pretty clear. If you look at the, the traffic light labelling on food, I find it fairly clear. In fact, people have got suggestions on how to make it clearer, then you know, let's look at those. Um, but it's actually, it's groups like Action on Sugar that have created this demonization of added sugar and pretend that it's inherently different to free sugar or, or sugar that comes naturally from fruit in the first place. There isn't any meaningful nutri nutritional difference between 
these types of sugars, certainly not in terms of the number of calories they contain. Actional sugar have gone out there, they've demonized added sugar. So companies have been incentivized to tell their customers that this product doesn't contain added sugar. It contains sugar that's come naturally from the fruit, but it's all a, a bit of a, you know, much of a muchness. Um, none of this stuff really matters. What matters is how many calories are in the product from the point of view of obesity. And from the point of view of nutrition, it means not just whether something has sugar in it, Actually, on sugar, sugar portray any food that has sugar in it as being inherently unhealthful. It, it's not, not the case. We would need to look at things like vitamins, fiber, fat as well. And for years now, we've been too focused on sugar. And people are eating much less sugar than they used to in the 70s, incidentally. So it's not obvious that it's a cause of the rise in obesity in this country. We've had a single-minded focus on sugar when we should be looking at nutrition in the round. Who do, who do you blame for rising ob obesity? I don't blame anybody, and I don't think there's any one single uh, variable or factor behind it. Uh, it's a very complex issue. It's been seen all around the world. Uh, I think the bottom line is that once you have a society where everybody can afford to eat more or less uh, whatever they want, whenever they want, then it largely becomes a, a matter of genetics. Christopher Snowden, the Institute of Economic Affairs, thanks as ever for joining us on GB News. Joining us now is Rhiannon Lambert, who is a registered nutritionist. Hello, Rhiannon. My goodness, you look like a healthy nutritionist. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much sugar is too much sugar, in your view? Um, it's been really interesting, actually, listening to your speakers as well, because as a mum myself and as a nutritionist, I know that children under the age of two shouldn't really be having any added sugars in their diet. The recommendations are, first of all, it's very difficult to brush a child's teeth in the first place. And we've got a stat now that a quarter of children aged five in the UK are experiencing tooth decay. So there's also the tooth decay aspect. And when it comes to sugar, there's no real major guidelines for children. We're saying around 13 grams from age two, then up to five. And it does increase as we get older up until adults when you know we can consume up to 90 grams a day, but 30 of which is free sugars. And I think there's a big confusion with the type of sugar. I've heard you mention earlier, you know, carbohydrates, which of course are a glucose form of sugar. But the sugar that I think people are worried about are the added white refined sugar that you see that's added into different foods, added into sauces on the shop shelves. And for children in particular, they just don't need it at that age. And we should be focusing more on the other nutrient values values in the food. So even concentrates and purees that are very popular, they count as a free sugar because we're not eating a banana, we're eating a mashed up banana, which means sugar releases more quickly into the system once you've blitzed it or pureed it or made it into a concentrate. So sugar is a really complex subject. It's not black and white at all. And this is daytime television. A lot of our viewers are parents of toddlers, preschool children, what would you say to parents? What kind of things should they be giving their kids and what shouldn't they be giving their kids? What about dried fruit, for instance? Isn't that a good thing? So, um, as a parent myself, I obviously took more of an interest in childhood nutrition and I feel for every parent out there, I've got an 18 month old and it's really difficult to navigate what to do. Dried fruit, while it may seem healthy, should not be offered as a snack before the age of five. It can really stick to the teeth. And as I mentioned earlier, brushing a little one's teeth is a nightmare in the first place. But often you find these items are really marketed heavily and cleverly with really cool you know little um cartoon characters and things on them to make them appeal to our youngsters whereas actually it's not the best option dried fruit is also a really fast releasing source of energy as well and maybe one that's better for older children not younger children the best snacks are going to be a classic just eat an, eat an apple um you can make your homemade oat bars at home but i get it time is short everybody's so tired and you're running on no energy you might be sleep deprived cheese is a really good snack as well that you know you could just get out a block of cheese cut up a tiny portion of that serve it alongside some fruit or some veggie sticks that you've made and there are some good options out there that you can buy that don't have this much sugar in them uh, young people many of them are choosing a vegan diet is it healthy <laughs> I love this question. Um, so veganism is very different from plant-based. Plant-based just means reducing animal products. 
veganism is completely omitting it. And as a nutritionist myself, and I work with clients in my nutrition clinic, I'm a big believer that, you know, not one diet is healthier than other. You can be an unhealthy vegan, but you can also be a healthy vegan. You can be a vegan and eat chips and burgers and fast foods all day long. But equally, you could be an amazingly healthy vegan that takes their supplements, that gets a wide variety of food, fruit, vegetables, fiber, and be perfectly healthy. So like every diet in the world, it's not one size fits all. It's how you choose to adopt it and how it works for your body. It strikes me, Rhiannon, without wanting to sound too old fashioned, that a lot of young parents, they struggle to know how to cook, how to prepare fresh vegetables, how to get beyond takeout food and unhealthy options. Again, this sounds unfashionable, but should we be reintroducing domestic science lessons in school? So to help ordinary people make their pounds and pennies go further when feeding their families? I don't think that's unpopular at all. I think that's missing from curriculums. Um, I think we should have a lot more focus on, I mean, I'm a nutritionist, I'm very biased, but I do believe that we lack basic cooking skills today. And you can save a fortune if you cook from scratch, if you know how, you need to utilize your freezer, utilize canned foods. They're not bad if they're in a can, you can get a can of lentils and beans and pulses for a fraction of the price of actually buying a chicken breast or something that day or a McDonald's even. So actually, if you look at the bigger picture, we need to be cooking from scratch more. But, you know, I know how hard it is as a parent myself when you work really long hours and you're restricted with time. I think time also matters. Rhiannon Lambert, registered nutritionist. Come back again. Very interesting. Thanks for joining us on GB News. I did, I did domestic, but well, it's called home economics. Home economics, yeah. I mean, I can't cook anything, so that's not the answer. Well, I mean, it can't, but it's not the silver bullet, at least, as I condemn You're it. a hopeless cause, the Piero. <laughs> now, we've heard from our guests debating whether we need to get tough on sugar. We want to know what you think about this. You can email in to share your views on GB Views at gbnews.uk. We've also started a poll on this issue over on the GB News Twitter page. You can add your vote via at GB News. Up next. There's another significant wave of small boats coming across the English Channel today. We'll have the details after the weather. Stay with us. Hello again. Something of a north-south split with the weather today. Brighter skies across the north with some sunshine. Much of the south fairly drab with um, outbreaks of rain and drizzle for some as well. That's being caused by this rippling, wiggling weather front that's uh, kind of grinding to a halt through the rest of today over the Midlands, parts of South Wales and East Anglia. So some outbreaks of rain likely here. The far southeast may see a little bit of brightness, but much of the southern half of the UK covered in cloud. Brighter skies for Northern England, Southern Scotland, Northern Ireland. In the far northwest, though, it is windy and there will be a few showers coming in here, particularly over the highlands. Temperatures across the north, 10, 11 at best with a bit of sunshine. It is pretty mild further south, 15, 16 in the London area, but it doesn't feel all that mild if you're stuck under that weather front and the cloud, rain and drizzle, which will continue on and off through the evening to push into parts of East Anglia, maybe down towards the southeast before tending to fizzle out. Another band of showery rain across northern Scotland, otherwise largely dry and some fog is likely. It could be quite thick through the early hours over parts of northern England, north Wales, southern Scotland, where things will turn quite chilly. Again, it will stay pretty mild overnight across the south. So another mild day here. Again, predominantly cloudy across the uh, south. There'll be the odd shower coming into North Wales later, maybe south of Scotland, northwest England. But some brightness likely across eastern areas. Uh, a bit of sunshine, but generally fairly cloudy. The breeze starting to strengthen. And notice behind me there are further bands of rain. That's tied into an area of low pressure that's going to bring uh, more persistent rain across the country during Thursday evening and into Friday. And it will increase the winds as well. So that area of low pressure really will dominate from Thursday night onwards, bringing, as I say, a spell of wet and windy weather for most coming in and then kind of fizzling out. So it turns drier through Saturday. And at the moment, Sunday looks dry for much of the UK. Bye for now.
You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. Just missing my William Haig impressions in the break. Look at you. Now Glory we're trying to remember what GCSE <laughs> she actually passed. She didn't pass home economics, we've no. learned. No, we're but you did scrape a C in Italian. She's Italian! We can sh you can shame me all you like. <laughs> uh, we're asking if we should get tough on sugar today. It's because a study has found what it calls alarming amounts of sugar in children's snacks, which claim to be healthy. Get in touch with your view. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now to an update on a developing situation on a story GB News has kept you up to date with. There's another significant wave of small boats coming across the English Channel today. Around 10 boats have been intercepted so far. Here with the latest is our home security, home and security editor, Mark White. Mark. Uh, yes, yeah, still ongoing. Uh, so those 10 boats that were intercepted, that was this morning. Uh, in addition, there have been a number of other rescue and interception operations taking place in the Channel. We believe now up to 11 vessels, uh, small boats that are being intercepted by border force. You can see the border force vessels there, but not just them, lifeboats as well. There simply are not enough border force vessels to be able to deal with the number of small boats that are coming across, because they all come across in waves. So 10 this morning, and then another 10 or 11 this afternoon so far, and it continues. And there's only a uh, you know, uh, about four uh, border force vessels that are available at any one time around the Dover area. So they're clearly swamped. They're not able to deal with it. So they're calling in the lifeboats. And we know that already this morning uh, and currently the Dover, Ramsgate, Dungeness and Walmer lifeboats have all been out, all responding to incidents out in the Channel. Mark, thinking back to previous summers, it seemed to me, obviously, in May, June, July, August, September, into October, you'd get people trying to cross the channel illegally, as these people are. We're now going into November, December. I mean, this must become more treacherous. How do the numbers compare to previous years? Well, this is the frightening thing about it. You can see that border force cutter coming in, the seeker coming in there to Dover Harbour, uh, a little earlier on, absolutely packed out with people uh, at the bow of the ship and then at the stern as well, and others inside that vessel that had been plucked uh, from a number of vessels. There's another one on the beach. Now, this is an example of boats that are just left to drift out in the channel because there's so many of them mm. that the lifeboat or border force can't take them in tow. 
at the same time. So you you get them left out in the middle of the channel. And then, of course, passing shipping are calling in, thinking that this is a migrant boat that has overturned with people in the mm, water, mm. which then so causes, the SOS. Them, which yep. causes them more in the way of workload to go out and respond to that. And to get back to your original point, Liam, you're absolutely right. There is a great deal of concern from UK and French authorities about a significant loss of life, the potential for that now. Because really it was last year we noticed, unlike the previous two years, where during the winter months the small boats had stopped coming across. Last year, on the calmer days, we were still getting a few boats coming across. This year now we're getting mm. into the winter months uh, in the month ahead. Uh, and they're still coming, and there's no end in sight. In fact, uh, more people are arriving daily uh, along the northwest coast of France, in Dunkirk, in Calais, and Boulogne. Uh, French authorities are erecting temporary shelters for them there because they don't want them having to do what they're doing at the moment, which is sleeping in the streets of Calais and Dunkirk, sleeping under underpasses when we get into sub-zero temperatures. Uh, but aside from, you know, the living conditions they're facing in France, it's coming out into the channel in these conditions which are never ideal in the channel, even on the, the kind of day where it's fat, flat, calm. You think perfect conditions to cross. Well, you can... The winds can whip up in the channel mm. in an instant. They did this morning, we're told, for a couple of hours, which caused some boats to get into difficulty. Um, and also there's the currents, strong currents in the channel. And it's one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. So there's the wake of boats and the, you know, the shipping themselves that uh, pose a real threat to these small, flimsy vessels trying to make that 21-mile crossing to the English side of the coast. Mark White, thanks for that update. Thank you very much. Right after this break, it's all about your opinion. Join the debate next on De Piero and Halligan first. The news headlines. I'm Rosie Wright. Let's get you up to date. A survivor of child sexual exploitation is calling for the resignations of the Rotherham Council leader and the South Yorkshire Police and Crime Commissioner. It comes after GB News revealed that up to 1,600 risk assessments have been carried out on children considered to be vulnerable to grooming in the borough since 2017. A 28-year-old woman has been arrested in connection with a fatal dog attack in Caerphilly. Ten-year-old Jack Lees was mauled to death while at the home of a friend on Monday. The dog was destroyed by firearms officers. Sir Geoffrey Cox says he doesn't believe he's broken parliamentary rules after he was accused of using his MP office to carry out private work for the British Virgin Islands inquiry. Labour is calling for a standards investigation with the deputy leader Angela Rayner saying his actions appear to be a brazen breach of the rules. Lord Frost has told Parliament Europe should stay calm and keep things in proportion in the row over the Northern Ireland Protocol. But the Brexit minister reassured the House of Lords he would not give up on the process until it is abundantly clear that nothing more can be done. The Prime Minister has returned to the COP26 conference in Glasgow where negotiators from nearly 200 countries are scrutinising a first draft of the agreement. The paper published this morning is urging nations to revisit and strengthen their emissions targets for 2030 so that global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Sir Elton John has been honoured by the Prince of Wales for his career in music and his campaigning work on AIDS. The musician received an Order of the Companions of Honour. Sir so David Attenborough and Dame Judi Dench also received the award. You are up to date. I'll have more for you at three o'clock. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. And back to our main debate. We're asking today if there should be tougher regulations to control the amount of sugar in food and drink products. Health campaigners' action on sugar have found a number of snacks aimed at children contain high sugar content despite claiming to be the healthy option. The health campaign group wants tougher rules to reduce the amount of sugar contained in food and drinks. But early in the programme, we heard from Christopher Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs, who feels that would be heavy-handed. I don't find anything particularly shocking in, in this report. Action on sugar for years now have just been going through the ingredient lists of various uh, products in supermarkets and then listing the amount of sugar, putting them into tablespoons or teaspoons rather, and then declaring the findings to be shocking. Uh, I don't think there's anything particularly shocking. I think the, the, the worst of the products had um, 32 calories of, of sugar in them. That's what two teaspoons is. It doesn't seem like people are going to get uh, obese overnight. Uh, at, at any age, consuming 32 calories of sugar. So it's not clear to me what the, what the issue is, other than uh, a lack of labelling, which I think is a fair point. Catherine Jenner is the campaign director of Action on Sugar and joins us. Catherine, what do you want to do about sugar? What, what, what are the public policy implications of this debate? Well, we would like to see less sugar being put into food in the first place. That would be the easiest and simplest thing to do. So the people that made these foods just thought, hang on a second, we don't need to be giving very young children lots of sugar, so let's just find something else to put in instead. But what we really need for that to happen is that we need govern government to give everyone a little push along their way. So no, com no one company wants to be the one that's got low sugar foods. What we need is for all companies to do it at the same time, a level playing field. And for that, we need a good, sensible, comprehensive policy from government that's going to encourage incentivize companies to do that one of the ways of doing that was mentioned earlier was about having good labeling as well so once people can see what's in their food they can make a decision about what's in there and we can have a good clear look at what's in the food as well so that's a good way of being able to see what's in the food in the first place um, and then try and do something about it isn't there a danger catherine that if you are uh, incentivizing as you say companies to put less sugar in food that may mean that sugary foods have higher prices and so you just make food even more expensive for people who are struggling to feed their families well there's no reason why that should be the case i mean good food doesn't have to be expensive and the Part of the problem is that not everyone's buying it at the moment. So there's a few maybe niche products that not everyone's buying that might be slightly healthier. Well, everyone, if everyone was buying those foods, there'd be an economy of scale to it. We'd all be uh, able to reduce the prices of them. So we need to make sure they're commercially acceptable. But most importantly, they do need to be affordable for all. And when you look at some of these infant food products, they're really expensive. And the, the alternatives of making your own um, at home is so much cheaper. So I think that there's definitely a cost element to it, but it certainly, doesn't, it certainly shouldn't be more expensive to buy healthier food. And when we talk about a sugar tax, it's tended to be focused on fizzy drinks. Would you like to see that extended to other products? So the sugary drinks tax was only really meant to be the start. It was always meant to be extended to other food categories. And we've talked before about snacks. But what's interesting about the interest, the uh, 
infant and baby food is that all of those foods have been excluded from every kind of policy, not just the sugary, sugary drinks tax. So drinks that are aimed at very young children that you see in the infant aisle, they're excluded from it. Also, the upcoming legislation on advertising and promotions restrictions also excludes baby and infant food. So really, the whole area needs to be widened out and a sugar tax would be one way to do it. Put it to you, Catherine, that um, obesity, of course, which is a huge drain on the NHS, a huge cause of human misery, as well as being expensive for the state. Obesity is mainly not about what we eat, it's about lifestyle choice. So you're just barking up the wrong tree with respect. I mean, there's so many reasons behind our obesity at the moment, so I don't think you could say that it's any one thing, but the food that we eat and consume gives us those extra calories that leads to overweight. So how they're promoted to us, how they're advertised to us, all these things are important. And of course, what we actually eat, what's in the food is important. So there's so much that needs to be included. And of course, it's, we have to look beyond obesity to wider health implications as well. So I think it was mentioned earlier about dental health. I think one in four children suffers from dental decay under the age of five. This is a huge cause of suffering, not just of pain, but also of mental health and parental worry as well. So I think we need to look at a much bigger picture um, and see what we can be doing to try and help our food systems work right from the start, from the earliest age possible. One of our viewers has been in touch, Chris Mycroft, to say I'm very wary of a sugar tax. These taxes mean poorer people will have to reduce their consumption of these items, whilst wealthier people won't. Fair comment. Well, that's not what happened with the sugar tax, actually. So the sugary drinks tax actually worked as a way to encourage food, food drink manufacturers to reformulate their drinks. So all of the main drinks have been reformulated to have a little bit less sugar in them now. So people are still buying and drinking the same drinks. They've just got less sugar in it. So it was a tax on the manufacturers. They pay a levy if they want to have higher amounts of sugar in their drinks. Us as consumers, we don't have to bear that cost and we don't have to make that choice. We still buy and drink whatever we want. And it's been amazingly successful, not only in reducing the sugar that we're buying and drinking, but also um, the companies seem to have profited from it as well. And also the government has profited from bringing in some money from the levy. So hopefully a win-win-win. So I think we really need to explore other fiscal measures that will not be regressive to those worst off in the population. The processed food lobby is very, very powerful, Catherine. Jenna, we're often talking about big multinational companies with an awful lot of political clout. What would be the one policy recommendation that you would want ministers to try to implement that has the most chance of actually sticking and holding the road politically and being effective? We would like to see gradual reformulation across the whole of the food industry, so less calories, less sugar and less salt. And for that to happen, the government needs to mandate targets, give these, tar these companies something to work towards and incentivise them to move quicker um, so that we can improve our health as quickly as possible. Catherine Jenner, Campaign Director of Action on Sugar, who published the report that we're discussing today. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on GB News. Let's get the view from Dr David Lloyd, who's a GP in London. David, good to see you. Um, would, if we ate less sugar, would we be less fat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, OK. Is it as simple as it does A equal B? You cut back on sugar, you're going to lose weight, or is it more complicated than that? Well, it depends on the percentage of sugar in your diet. But yes, sugar is a very potent source of calories. Uh, and as you know, I'm sure somebody over your day-to-day your -day has said, 27.8% of the UK adult population are obese or very obese. It is a huge issue. And, as, and I heard you say a couple of minutes ago, the stress and the strain on people uh, who then access health services trying to get the services they need because their bodies have fallen apart because they have so much weight on board. People's knees crumble, people's hearts fail, uh, and it's a, it's a horrible, horrible condition to have. And it all starts when you're a baby, doesn't it? If you're, if you're subjected to sweet things as a baby, you're going to grow up liking sweet things. I, I'm absolutely guilty of that. I remember as a teenager, my mother buying us packs and packs and packs of Coca-Cola. And we would just go to the larder and take a can, you know, two or three times a day. And I'm hooked now. So I, I now have to take diet drinks and put pills in my coffee so to, because I'm hooked on the taste of sugar. 
uh, and I'm not exactly thin either. So it is a real issue, and I, I applaud anybody that's trying to do something about this. I think somebody called it white death, and I think it's quite a good apt and description. Dr. Lloyd, you're, you're not only a distinguished GP, you're a GP of long experience, if I may say so. How do you think yeah, the right. shape of the nation has changed, if you like? How much fatter are we, the, the sur people who visit your surgery, the people you see in your day-to-day -day role as a GP, than we were, say, 20 or 30 years ago? No, I, I'm afraid I can't quantify it, but you're absolutely right to point that out. I think. I think that the shape of humanity in the United Kingdom has changed beyond all, all recognition. That data I don't have, but I'm sure if you were to ask Marks and Spencers or Next or somebody on the high street what size clothes they're now stocking on their shelves, you'll find that the, their sizes have gone up year on year. And you look at babies, I know that because I've got uh, three grand, four grandchildren now. Uh, and you're going into shops now and you're buying baby grows that for newborn babies that were in the old days for six month old babies. So we're, we've got a real problem with, with, with uh, you know, obesity, I hate to say the word, because I will be labelled as fattest. The former head of NHS England, Simon Stevens, describes obesity as the new smoking. The way that we, yes. well, there's a debate about how we got people to, to stop smoking. I would say vaping was quite a big part in it. But it meant massive increases in prices, huge public um, health campaigns, very, very graphic ones. Mm. Are you suggesting we might need something similar for sugar? Um, are you suggesting a tax on sugar? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just saying if, if obesity is yes. comparable to smoking as today's yes. public oh, health yes. crisis, then the way we got really tough on smoking, we, we whacked up prices for fags, yes. for cigarettes, yes. um, and we had that really graphic uh, public health campaign on those packets yes. of cigarettes. Yes, uh, can you imagine? Yes. I'm not sure the public would go for that if it was on a chocolate bar. Well, it, it is. Well, I think I, I've got a slightly better example than that in that alcohol is also very bad for you. And there are some beautiful graphs which I could illustrate which show the amount of alcohol consumed is entirely proportional to the amount of tax and the price of alcohol in the shops and there's a direct relationship between consumption and price and so i can't believe that that sugar won't be any different if we start taxing sugar then then sugar consumption will go down and there are lots of alternatives i i mean i'm not a vegan one of my daughters is and she's very thin so uh you know there are, there are really good things that aren't sugar do you think parents dr lloyd are less capable than they were when you started out as a GP uh, in terms of feeding their children healthy food in an economical way? I think, I, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you're, gonna, you're hearing the opinions of a very old man, but yes, I think that's right. The so-called nuclear family, mother and husband and wife and children, uh, is, is a less useful family, family size than having a few grandparents around as well, and an extended family who can give you advice in those first vital months as your children start to grow up. I think extended families are healthier families as far as that's concerned. And yes, I agree with you. If you the, the pattern in this country uh, has been for a long time that people very much survive on their own without the advice. And you can't, much as our fantastic health visitors are, are able to give fantastic advice, it really is a lot of this needs to come from the family so as to, again, take some of the strain off the NHS. London GP, Dr David Lloyd, as ever, we appreciate your insights. Thanks for being with us. Joining us now from Paris is Giancarlo Caldesi, a London restaurant and cookery school owner. Nice to see Hi. you. What lessons do you Thank have you for much. us? Or should I say bonsoir or bon, 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 bon après-midi uh, de Paris? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us your own story. Um, well, I, uh, I have my, my story is very simple, really. I, 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 I was uh, uh, quite large, and um, I changed my lifestyle, and obviously uh, cu cutting carbs and sugar, and then I managed to reshape my life. Uh, one of the problem that I have on your speakers is that everybody wants to put tax. Tax on what? 
what we should do, what we must do, is to really educate the parents, then they will educate the kids. Uh, because without the education of what our sugar is bad for you or whatever happens, um, it's very important the knowledge, the, to be knowledgeable of what you eat makes you not very well or really changes your life. That's very, very important. Carlo, what was it in your mind that changed your lifestyle? Did a, 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 a switch flick in your head to make you realize you did have to lose weight? Was it a particular issue, a particular comment from a person? A lot of people will be no. listening and for advice from you about how they can get on top of their weight problem. Well, thank you for asking. My sim simple, simple, very simple. I couldn't do my shoelaces. I couldn't do my shoelaces and I, and I couldn't get up from a chair. And I said, this is enough. And um, uh, unfortunately, when COVID has arrived and uh, uh, I haven't been well, um, if I was on the, on the state that I was before, I think I would have been a dead man by now. Uh, so that goes to show you. Um, I, I really don't agree uh, on tax everything. What, what, what's the problem taxing? The thing that we should do is that adverts on television should be much, much sincere not to launch a company to make more money, but to really make the human being fitter. That's important. The other thing that we need to really look for is, is, is an amazing part of education from the school to really understand what food is all about. And food, basically, um, yes, carbs is fine, some part of sugar is fine, but the reality is if we can cut down on that, and make sure that the kids that don't have 20, they go to a kid's party and suddenly you get a bag full of sweeties. Why? What is the big deal? You know, mm -hmm. we all crave sugar because our brains want sugar. The body doesn't really. Giancarlo. I mean, absolutely the body doesn't. Yeah, Giancarlo, I try to do what, what you do. I, I try not to eat sugar and I try not to eat, to eat carbohydrates. It's expensive not to eat carbohydrates. I've... I, in my view. I, okay, no, I, I understand. I, I can assure you, uh, really, that without carbs, without those, those sugary things, you can have a, 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 a same life. It is not more expensive or less. I done it myself. I do it every day. I mean, I know I'm a chef. I know I'm, I've got restaurants. And quite frankly, um, the sugar fight is really a bad education to all of us for uh, many companies to make more money. Why do you have to put eight teaspoons of sugar in, in, in 200 ml of sh or, or drinks? It's, 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 it's really, that's, it's killing people. So we need to really re-educate ourselves. And the, the, this big company, they need to take responsibility. And the government should do, impose the fact that you do not advertise the uh, sugar this and sugar that, make it look so glamorous. We need to look at reality. Why Giancarlo. do we have to put things so glamorous? Giancarlo, we've got to leave it there. Giancarlo Caldese, restaurant owner, Thank you. joining us from Paris. You've been mailing email emailing us throughout the show. Should we get John, tough on sugar? John says, being a type 2 diabetic, I prefer zero sugar. However, 3% is manageable, but even bread often contains 5% or more. Tax needs increasing to keep us all healthy. Frida says, sugar causes a huge range of issues, from diabetes to heart disease. It also affects people's mental health, makes them more irritable, and uh, a tendency to last out. Tristan says, every time I go into a normal street store, almost three quarters of the options are cheap, easy access, sugary food and drinks. Daryl says they should definitely get tougher. It already costs a lot for the NHS to deal with all the diabetes cases due to obesity. Bill says a lot of products take real sugar out and replace it with others, which then causes health problems as well. Beck says people have to learn to moderate their own intake and diet, otherwise it will impact their health. You've been voting in our Twitter poll and 64% have said yes to should the UK get tough on sugar, 36% have said no. Interesting. Two thirds, one third in favour of harsher conditions on sugar. More sugar tax. You're watching, been watching De Pierre and Halligan here on GB News. We're back tomorrow at 2 p.m. I'm back at noon. You're back at one on your own. And just in a, mo in a moment, Darren McCaffrey with your politics. Hello again. Something of a 